thank you for having me. Uh, this is my second time around uh, because of the uh, politely persistent Christine in uh, trying to get me to uh, share another session uh, in in Bidu. So again, thank you very much for having me. I it's a it's a pleasure for me to be able to speak over here again. Uh, and the theme today supposedly is about persistence. And um, how many of you have seen Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Exactly. One person. Great. I have to explain everything again. There. Anyways, homework for all of you who haven't watched the movie. You gotta watch the movie after the show. It's a ridiculous, funny, I, it's absurd actually, but uh, it's pretty fun. I watched it several times. And uh, well, my, my story is supposed to be uh, because I'm talking about uh, persistence and how to relate to you guys. Uh, it's Ryan's guide to uh, post-college life. It's anyways. You don't get the movie. You don't get the joke. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, if you guys want to uh, follow me on my social media, my Twitter and Instagram account is Ryan Guzali. I mostly share about obviously sports uh, and many things in in current issues and yeah, more of the serious side sometimes, but also a lot of jokes. So feel free to uh, follow me to uh, in my social media account. But the point is why I, I, I uh, used this slide to, uh, for my title is uh, the tagline below, don't panic. And you know, I was once a college student and I was in your shoes a while ago, obviously. <laughs> uh, and I remember how hard it is, well not how hard, but it's more like how confused I was when I was in your position and trying to figure out what I'm gonna do with my life. What I'm gonna do uh, with is it gonna be related to my major? Uh, you know, all that questions that I'm sure a lot of you have right now. Uh, so I'm hoping that you know, from my experience, I can share a bit in terms of uh, what works for me, what doesn't work for me, and hopefully from this presentation, you guys can apply it to your life, and it will be beneficial as well. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna start off with a more of a serious note in my next slide. So, I'm gonna start with the statements. statements. Um, ever had your teacher gave up on you? Ever had to live on a ticker uh, in, in a living room? Ever had to work two jobs for 14 hours a day? Ever have people look down on you and think you're a lost cause? And ever had to eat instant noodles and dollar menu daily? Ever had to do any of that? Any of you here? No? Okay, one person, the hitchhiker guide person. <laughs> Anyways, uh, all these things uh, is everything that happened to me back in my uh, post-college life. Because, uh, and, and I'll go through it one by one, you know, my teacher gave up on me basically uh, during my high school years, during my elementary school as well. I wasn't the greatest in school subjects. My teacher came up to my parents and say, you know what, I gave up your son. I can't teach him anymore. He just doesn't listen. He just doesn't understand. Uh, he's not gonna have a bright future and I'm giving up on teaching your son. You better find yourself a new teacher to teach your son. Um, after I graduate from college, uh, I don't have enough money to start something on my own and the way that I do it, the way that my family does it, they believe in giving you uh, the fishing rod instead of giving you the fish. They want to teach me to be independent and therefore when I graduate, I mean I really don't have any income yet, I'm just trying to find a job. So I had to rent a living room which I share with two person and I was living with a tikar, which I don't know what the English word for that, with a makeshift mattress, whatever you call it. Um, <coughs> I also had to work during my master's degree uh, era uh, when I was taking my sports management master's degree. I had to work two jobs and that accumulates to 14 hours a day. Uh, and that's a daily thing while I'm taking my master's degree. So it was, it was really tiring physically and mentally. And um, when, I, when I jumped to the sports industry, a lot of people were questioning my, my direction. My family wasn't sure what exactly I'm doing, my friends, also were like asking questions in Indonesia what can you do with sports 
I mean, everything is in ruin here, especially in sports. So they're like, they have no idea what to do. I mean, they have no idea what can be done, and they just feel like I'm a lost cause. And lastly, you know, again, <laughs> uh, this is during my post, uh, during my master's degree years. You know, I had to really save a lot of money. Uh, so I was living on a uh, four or five US dollars uh, budget a day for my uh, food. So I ended up eating a lot of dollar menus and obviously we got Indomie, uh, which is a lifesaver <laughs> for a while. Uh, and that all happens to me. And this all relates to what I'm trying to talk about today, the topic of the day, which is persistence. Um, let me start off by actually uh, letting you guys know what it was like for me growing up back in the days as a 90s kid, a 80s kid. Uh, as a typical Chinese Indonesian, I do the things that a lot of people do. I read a lot of mangas, I play a lot of sports, I'm a Manchester United fan. Before they were famous, before they were cool, I, I, uh, I was a video game addict. I am still undefeated playing that game on the top right there, Bishibashi. In a best of three, nobody beat me forever yet. So, anybody want to challenge me? I'm up for it. Um, I do piano lessons, I take violin lessons. I mean, it's a very typical Chinese Indonesian life. I have a uh, after school uh, class for, you know, school project, whatever. Uh, just a very typical life, you know. Um, and uh, I am very passionate about sports. I am very active in sport, although I don't have the physicalities right now. Uh, I, uh, I'm a FIFA athlete now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, uh, it, it, it allowed me to experience the full boundaries of, of living in Indonesia. And then, um, actually this one first. And then uh, the uh, tragic story of May 98 happened. You know, I was forced to move out of the country. Uh, there was a lot of racial tension that happened. As a Chinese Indonesian in particular, we were scapegoats uh, of the economical situation, of the political tension, and a lot of my, uh, we had to escape. You know, a lot of our relatives, a lot of our friends, some got their stores burned, some got their house looted, some even got raped. I know some who got raped. Uh, my, my dad was a doctor, uh, and he couldn't get out so uh, and because of the you know when you become a doctor you're supposed to say the uh, hippotamus promise that you are obliged to serve people you are obliged to help people no matter what their background etc etc and then here uh, here he is uh, with the looters injuring themselves coming to the hospital my dad was forced with a dilemma I'm supposed to help him but I don't feel like helping him uh, so he did something in the middle, which is he still helped him without the anesthesia. Oh. <laughs> so when people sue him, I know, when he sued the, the looters up, I mean, they really feel the pain. So he kind of want them to feel the pain so that they, there is a, uh, there's an effect that, you know what, don't do it again. You know, don't do stupid things like that again. Um, but anyways, I was forced out of my country. I moved to Singapore. Uh, I, was, I was dislocated from my... Uh, Habitat, if you want to call it, and I started a new life in Singapore. And uh, but again, sports helped me uh, adjust to the new living environment. And I was playing in, I was playing football, and I was pretty good back then. Uh, not so much anymore. <laughs> but uh, I was playing. I was even trying out for the S League team for the under 17, uh, and then I broke my leg, and that was it. And I realized that, you know, after playing with a lot of the English guys and the Argentinian guys and the Brazilian, maybe I'm not that great. So, <laughs> maybe I should just stick to FIFA. Yeah, so even that, I'm not that good anymore. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, but then I went to, after the whole thing, I finished Singapore and I went to college in the America. I went to, uh, for my undergrad degree in UC Irvine, University of California, Irvine. Uh, for those of you who are gamers, any gamers here? Oh, always it's from this area. <laughs> area. Um, you know Blizzard? You guys know Warcraft, Starcraft? So their office is right in my campus. And we get to do senior projects, which we actually program for uh, the patch updates of World of Warcraft or Starcraft. Yeah, that's actually a class that my college teaches because it's right on campus and they hire people from campus. 
10 minutes, perfect. <laughs> so anyways, um, but uh, you know, I have the wrong impression because I told you I like games and when I take computer science as my undergrad undergraduate major, I thought it's, uh, you know what, I like to play games, uh, video games, it must be the same thing. Apparently not, I was fooled uh, into it. Um, it was really hard. <laughs> But anyways, I, I finished it, and I took a business management minor as well. And the thing with my, the way that my family raised me up is, as I told you, they, they are the type of people that don't give you fish, but give you the fishing rod. And uh, my mom in particular uh, said to me, I am going to fund you for four years and that's it. After that, you're on your own. So when I took my business management minor, it was a, uh, you know, it's not really uh, the same subject as computer science, so you don't you don't have classes that correlate with each other So you can take credits for your graduation So you have to really take it again from the very beginning which means I have to take an extra semester and My mom was like hey, I only promised four years. I'm sure you're smart enough to figure out how to pay that So, <laughs> so I ended up taking a loan um, for my college education and I finished it and I uh, but by the time I graduate, you know, even though I have three internships before I graduate, I still wasn't so sure where I had to go to. But I know deep in my heart that, you know, because my passion is in sport, I really want to get into sport, but I just don't know how. Uh, so I keep keep on looking and uh, while I sort of find a safe job and pay for my living first and get stable, I always try to look for ways to get into sports. Uh, and then after the postgrad year, I work in banking industry, I work in consulting, I was working in biotechnology, so for example in biotechnology I'm actually working in uh, clinical trial research, so let's say uh, Johnson & Johnson is trying to research a cure for cancer or cure for AIDS, then I take care of all the clinical trials uh, until it is actually approved and it is safe to be used by a human being. Um, so it's, it's actually a pretty good, <clears throat> well-paying job. It's a very stable job. Uh, my dad loved it because he's in the medical industry and I'm in somewhat in the medical industry and we got things to talk about. And there, he's happy. I'm not. <laughs> um, but like I said, you know, I, I, I was still involved in, in, in sports in so many ways, whether it be in the, in the office or, you know, I go to church sometimes, I make, I make uh, sports events for my communities, for Indonesian communities, so I ended up hosting like a futsal competition, basketball competition, regional competition. I set it up in America. It went pretty good. Uh, it was called the Bay Area Cup, based in San Francisco. Uh, so I was really actively involved, even though I'm not in the sports industry. Um, and then I had a moment of epiphany. Uh, SAT word there. <laughs> uh, I had a revelation. I had a moment where, you know what? I really want to do sport and I started researching and I got lucky and um, um, I found a sports management master's degree in University of San Francisco so uh, I started looking to that more seriously because I don't know how to monetize this I mean I know Manchester United has a lot of money I know the Dallas Cowboys has tons of money and, and so on and so forth but I, I'm not involved in it yet, so. So, what happened was I started to become an entrepreneur. Um, and I started to create a uh, 17,739 square feet uh, of indoor sports facility in the East Bay, in the best Bay Area, uh, San Francisco Bay Area. And um, the deal was, you know, I was doing this with my partner, the deal was, if I do this, I'm gonna leave my job, I'm gonna get a scholarship, to go to you, uh, get my master's degree, which I did, and then I'll take care of it. I'll, I'll do the two jobs, as I mentioned before. Uh, <clears throat> uh, but apparently, when I started the uh, when I started the facility business, that's actually the news article when we first opened, and that's actually me kicking the ball right there. Um, America was having a economical recession. It was one of the worst uh, in in recent years. And so everybody was very, very scared to spend. Everybody was just holding on to their pockets and not wanting to spend. So when we actually opened up, we already agreed on a rental lease that is very, very expensive because it was, it was done, what, four months before the recession. So it was still very high, but we want to start a business. We thought it's going to be booming. It's going to be, keep on going economically stable. It's not. So 
we burn our cash in the first three in the first three uh, three months, uh, and it was just so stressful. It was uh, we had no more money to spare, uh, and things started to looking south. And then I remember this, you know, Benjamin Franklin once says, you know, energy and persistence conquers all things. Uh, it wasn't that great, actually. Uh, we had to, as I mentioned, because of the economic situation, nobody's spending, and uh, things are looking bad. You know, my, my salary got readjusted because of the situation. I still have to pay for a lot of things. I didn't have the money. That's why I said in the very beginning, you know, I only have money to spend on renting a living room. I was living on a McDonald's daily meal, uh, dollar menu meal, I was doing all that. I was working two jobs and it was, my, my family in particular would start asking me, what are you doing with your life? So, um, but this is what I remember. And then I keep on going and going and being persistent and being consistent. Um, and I got a molding process basically. Uh, a test of will and resolve. So it, it was like it was like the universe trying to test me that you know do you really want to be in sports? Because if you do, it's not going to be easy. I have to suffer from the very beginning. What I achieved in uh, previously in my last career doesn't mean a thing, which I went head on, and I got lucky after I um, got my master's degree. Uh, in between my master's degree program, I applied for a job in IMG. And IMG is the equivalent if you're in the technological industry, like you work in Google. Uh, they are huge, they're the biggest um, sports marketing agency and talent representation in the world. They have everything from you know uh, Tiger Woods, Michelle Wee, Federer, Nadal, uh, Sergio Aguero, Gerard Pique. They even have Victoria's Secret models with them. Um, if you look at Project Runway, IMG Models is the one that handles them. This is the same company that I work for. Uh, I really want a job uh, and there were 40 people applying for the job and miraculously I got it. So that was my molding process and the big break came uh, and then it went on further uh, and I went to work with T3. T3 is the biggest football academy in Japan. It has 170 schools. He's actually this guy right there next to Zinedine Zidane is Tom Bayer. He's contributed as one of the uh, the guy that changed the whole landscape for the Japanese football youth development. And he made me a director of his company because he wanted to expand to Indonesia. But even then, I thought I already had my big break. Apparently not. Because, be, uh, and because of the football situation in Indonesia, it's very unstable, very political. We tried to find an investor to create the same network of schools to Indonesia. We already got two thirds of the of the investment coming from Japan, only need a third coming from Indonesia, nobody bites in because of such an instability with the situation in Indonesia. So I thought, oh my goodness, I mean, am I gonna go through what I went through again in America? I already left everything and, and I, I thought I got a good thing going on in IMG and now it's down again. Because you thought once you get your big break, it's gonna go all up. No, not necessarily. Um, I came to a moment of honesty, you know, in that in that situation, in the, in my up and downs, I came, I became very honest with myself, and uh, it becomes a moment of truth. It becomes you become very honest with yourself, and you ask yourself, what do you want to do with your life? And this is the moment that it happens for me uh, when I was in my down period, and I find out that my measure of success is my, not my net worth, but my net impact. And ever since that, I was able to progress in a much more stable way because now I really know who I am. I really know what I want to do with my life. And everything is basing on that. And everything, uh, as long as, as I keep doing it persistently, uh, things are gonna happen. And that's what happened. But first of all, I need to be honest with myself. And I found myself in that period. So this is the real big break. Um, I like to quote something uh, from Proverbs. Uh, For though the righteous fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble when calamity strikes. So it's not, for you to be, uh, this is what I learned. It's not how many times you're successful. It's, it's more like how many times you fall and you rise up again. That's the most important thing, because up and downs happen so constantly in your life. And 
when I, I realized what I, I remember what my mom keeps saying to me. When you're on top, uh, don't be cocky. And when you're at the bottom, don't be uh, small hearted. And that's exactly what I applied in my life. You know, when I was up and down like that, I always have to uh, apply that rule in my life. And be politely persistent and sincere. This is something that Christine keeps doing to me. And, uh, and this is the life of an entrepreneur. It's, it's filled with uncertainty. And I started with, uh, I was completely broke when I came back here. And I started with zero rupiah. Uh, but I was given the chance to, uh, to take over what was called Liba Manas back then. Uh, because you know, uh, one of my, one of the people that we presented for the football academy school program was Mr. Eric Tohir. Uh, he's the owner of Inter Milan right now, an Indonesian who owns an Italian club, and he loves what I'm doing. He loves uh, the fact that I'm very passionate about my job. I'm very persistent in trying to make this happen, and he offered me like, hey, we should do something together, even though it's not a football project. I want to do something with you. And so I, I reconcept the whole thing and we come up with what we call Lima, which is Liga Mahasiswa. And it's the equivalent of NCAA, sorry, in America. And I'll go to that later. <laughs> okay, I don't know why you guys are clapping, but... <laughs> um, this is one of the quotes from Michael Jordan that I really like. I failed over and over and over again in my life, and that's why I succeed. You know, Lima's story. Now, uh, we built a 1 million US dollar company in less than three years. We are now employing 25 people and we have a media value of over 10 billion rupiah. We're the second, locus, second uh, local content that has their TV rights bought. We're the biggest in the university scheme right now. And uh, the companies below are spending multi-year uh, multi contracts for us. So this is something of an achievement that, uh, you know, as I was sharing with you guys from the beginning, up and down, up and down, but once you know yourself, once you, if you keep being persistent, you, you, you will get your break. Uh, but you gotta be honest with yourself and keep being persistent. And this is what Lima is right now. We are, uh, we are multi-sport, we are five sports right now. We are basketball, badminton, futsal, swimming and golf. That is the badminton right there, that's both basketball, that's futsal. Now we are on Compass TV, uh, national TV, just happened this year actually. Uh, and now I have another story, which is I am now um, handling the brand Umbro. Actually, could you play the video really quickly? Am I supposed to click something? Okay. Football and girls, what, what goes better? <laughs> so I just want to share with you a quick video of, of Umbro, just to give you an idea. This Gersin says sports is at the bottom of your interest list. It's a 90 year old company, Young. <laughs> it started with a uh, Focus in uh, the garment industry, so it could be apparels. It even went through rugby, it went through uh, other sports besides football, but throughout the years we evolved ourselves to be a, uh, a football company, football and futsal. Their mission statement is to be the best football company in the world. So this was when we were sponsoring Arsenal, we sponsored Liverpool. Manchester United, Everton, Chelsea, Brazil, Parma, Manchester City, England in 1966, all the way, that's Chelsea, that's when Manchester City won the Premier League, so we have a very long history uh, with the history of sport, that's Inter Milan when we had Ronaldo, that's Liverpool when the last ball did. European League before the Rafa Benitez era. Near Cosmos, we had Pele, we got Beckenbauer, we got Johan Cruyff, we got Bobby Moore. That's the 94 Brazil team. This is Gaza, Maradona. That's Roberto Carlos, if you know, that's the famous banana kick. That's Michael Owen in 98 against Argentina which they still lost. That's 
considering the World Cup, we did a campaign on the wax. <laughs> Into futsal. This is when we started to get into culture. This is Casapia uh, launching the England away jersey in France. And this is where we are now with balls. That's my shoes right now. Yeah. So we can go back to the slide really quickly. So right now I'm actually also handling Ambro Indonesia. Uh, I'm the CEO of the company as well. Uh, and we are also going to be sponsoring Lima on top of it. Um, so <clears throat> we, and we were bidding against three different big groups, uh, but they chose us to run it. Uh, and then the last one is the Indonesian sports story. I'm also consulting for the governor for all sports policies. And I'm also the vice director of Asian Games for Venue. So, <clears throat> the future, we don't know. Like I told you before, it's up and down. Right now, I'm on my up. I don't know how long this will last. It probably there will be downs in the future, but I'm ready for it because I know I'm persistent. Uh, I'm politely persistent and uh, I know myself. And that is a big enough uh, capital for you to run a successful life, in my opinion. That's all. Thank you. How, how did I, I, I start my patient? How did I can develop my patient to, to bring something to my life?